Sci Access, May 10, 2024. Keynote presentation by Dr. Chris Boschhausen. Thanks, Anna, and um, really great introduction. Thank you. I think that was almost my entire talk. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm just going to get the screen sharing going, but I just maybe wanted to give a couple of words, just kind of like a context, what I want to talk about today. So, I, um, I've been a, as far as my mum will tell me, I've been a space enthusiast since I was four, maybe young, younger. Um, I used to stay up at night watching Carl Sagan's Cosmos, if anyone's old enough to remember that esteemed gentleman and his wonderful you know, sort of science and astronomy show, cosmological show that he used to have. So it was a real treat to kind of like engage with space as a child. And I've always dreamt of going to space. And so my whole life and a lot of the things that Anna just talked about have been really me trying to figure out a path and, you know, in the sort of spirit of the name of this conference is what I wanted to talk about today. For those of you who were here uh, three years ago, I can't believe, it's, is it really that long? Nearly, right? Wow. Feels like yesterday. Um, but for those of who you here might have seen some of these slides before, and I wanted to just cover a bunch of things, um, you know, different levels of access and why, um, you know, getting to space has kind of always been hard and why it's getting just ever so slightly easier. You, you all remember the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey, so I wanted to tell a different story, which was um, 20 years late on schedule, the 2021, the democratization of spaceflight. And um, as you heard from Anna, uh, 2021 was an amazing year with the first of these conferences. And um, also this really amazing, almost like Cambrian explosion of hum humanity suddenly sending ordinary people to space. Um, and that has continued through to today. In fact, there'll be um, several more sort of regular person space flights this year to look forward to. Um, I think there's one coming up in like two weeks. So yeah, what, so what do, I, what do I wanna talk about here? Well, I mentioned my sort of growing up and me wanting to go to space. And certainly as a child, this was my image of um, what an astronaut looked like. Um, you know, clean haircut. I definitely have longer hair than, 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 than any of these uh, men for sure. Um, and, uh, you know, you know, uniforms and discipline and, you know, training in these, you know, trainer fighter planes and, you know, really kind of doing the right stuff. That was my images. And I think many of us maybe have shared that image, but that's not really who we are as humanity. All of us, you know, we're very diverse and different. And at the end of the day, I'm actually surprised the guy in the middle was even selected as an astronaut because he looks slightly too tall to me, <laughs> um, to fit in, in some of the older space capsules. So, you know, this is my image. And I, so when I was 17, I went, I'm an Australian. So I went to the Australian Defense Force Academy and applied to be a cadet. And I was hoping to get a scholarship for high school. When I graduated, I would then join the Australian Defense Force Academy um, and train as an officer, joining the Air Force, becoming a fighter pilot. And then in my 17 year old brain, I thought, well, then I'll get transferred to NASA. Uh, so we're transferred to the US Air Force and then get transferred to NASA and maybe get US citizenship and then train to be a shuttle pilot and then go up to space as a shuttle pilot. So that was my my kind of life plan, my vision board when I was 17. And um, I, I played the, ne the next slide in my talk three years ago as well. Um, so some of you might remember it, but um, certainly to the, um, to the man in the room, who has seen this before? Um, so at 17, I'm in this room with all these other young hopefuls hoping to get into the Air Force. And they yank me out of the line and take me back into, I guess, the commanding officer's room and say, you've been dismissed. Do you know you're colorblind? I'm like, what? <laughs> I had no idea. Turns out I could never actually tell the blue pencils from the purple pencils um, when I was a child but I certainly wasn't unprepared for this result. So they actually stamped my medical record permanently medically unfit for duty. And that denied me any officer role in the armed forces in Australia at all. And I could have enlisted, um, but then also with this supposed disability that I had just discovered, my rank would be capped at in Australia what they call warrant officer, which is a fairly low level, mid sort of mid-level rank. So, you know, even as an enlisted man, I would not have been able to um, progress very far in the military. So I 
kind of gave up on that. That was not going to happen. And certainly was not a, you know, being a warrant officer was not a path that was going to get me the um, experience and training and access that I needed to become an astronaut. So I resolved then on the way home, at least in my re re recreation of that day, um, that I would get myself, I'd get my butt to space um, one way or the other. And I was going to make that happen. And um, really what happened next and some of the things Anna talked about was a 27 year journey for me to finally realize that dream and fight a space with some really amazing people. So this really cool thing happened in, um, in 2021 after years and years and years of waiting, suddenly I mentioned there was this explosion of spaceflight activity. And um, in particular, this is one of my favorite photos this is Haley Arsenault who flew just a month or two before I did. Um, on the Inspiration4 mission with, you know, um, Cy and Proctor and, um, and uh, Chris and, and Jared. And it's just like an amazing photo because this is her, you know, with a photo of herself as a young child when she was suffering from very serious bone disease and she went off to become a patient at St. Jude's and then actually um, got better and finally went to space. And so this this photo is quite striking because it really kind of goes against this perception that I had as a as a as a as a teenager that you had to be perfect to go to space and um you know it's I think for me I I, I just adore this photo I think it's one of the greatest photos ever taken in space and a real triumph of, of human spirit and what's cool about it is just you know this is not someone that went through the ordinary path to be an astronaut and yet society is somehow caught up and allowed someone who you know potentially may have died as a child to live and get better through science and technology and medical care and you know the wonderful work they do at St. Jude's to ultimately go into space and so Haley is one of my big big heroes um so in my own way I also had a whole bunch of other misfortunes along the way and um I wanted to just show this yeah so there's just a little if people don't like seeing like unnecessary kind of surgical things, just look away for the next four slides. Um, but I was also a bit of a dumb kid. And when I was 19, I had a motorcycle against all the warnings of my parents and everybody else. And I crashed it and broke both my legs in eight places, which kind of also made me think, oh, well, there goes that spacing again. I really screwed up now because I, you know, don't even have good legs anymore. They're definitely not going to take me at NASA. And so this was one of the surgeries I had on my right leg to get that fixed. And then about 10 years later, um, sitting in my studio, the old version of my studio uh, here in San Francisco is the same thing on the left leg. Um, if anyone is a fan of sci-fi movies, you may recognize this apparatus. It's called um, an external fixator or the Il 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 Ilazarov technique, which is a way of straightening and correcting broken bones. Um, and that is because it's from this movie, Gadiga. So this is the same surgery that um, Ethan Hawke's character gets to become as tall as Jude Law so that he can become an astronaut to finally fly to space on a, an assumed personality. Because in that movie, again, there's this whole concept of genetic perfection. And it's a very, if you haven't seen the film, it's this dy dystopian story about how um, through some of the ill-intended or, you know, well, um, unintended consequences of genetic testing, um, people uh, who were born basically without being fully screened have huge amounts of societal disadvantages. Ethan Hawke was one of those guys. Jude Law was one of the privileged ones who was societally perfect, but he broke his back. And so um, Ethan Hawke decided he wanted to be an astronaut and he was going to overcome his disabilities. And one of the things he had to do was be tall enough to pretend to be Jude Law. I just wish I'm only five nine. I wish at the time they fixed my legs, they'd added three inches, um, but they did not. They they declined to <laughs> to do that for me. Um, but I always felt a connection to this movie as well, having kind of gone through the same thing. Um, so anyway, that's the end of that. Uh, so if anyone wants to come back, who was who took a little break there, you can come back. Um, so then I found this research. It got me thinking: What are the other things that um, astronauts have put up with? And I found this list of issues that somehow this research 
had been hidden from me for 20 years. I had never found this. And yet somehow putting sort of two and two together, I, I looked this up and finally realized that the astronauts that I had idolized and had put up on a pedestal as absolutely perfect were not, in fact, perfect. Um, they had many issues. They had, you know, obviously when you're training to be an astronaut the, at NASA, the program is very, very long. You might wait 10 years to finally get a spot to fly on a NASA space flight. And a lot of things can happen. You can tear a muscle, break a bone, um, get a hemorrhoid, um, get liver disease, um, have allergic reactions to things, develop allergic um, uh, sensitivities. Um, allergies is the word. Um, you know, kidney stones, all kinds of things. And this list is like crazy. And then um, two years ago, I was doing a Yuri's Night thing in at Kennedy Space Center for Yuri's Night on April 12th. And um, Story Musgrave, uh, who was you know an astronaut who was famous for having repaired the shuttle and uh, sorry repaired the Hubble Space Telescope and many many other things, he's one of the astronauts that spanned the Apollo era through to the shuttle era. And um, Story is an amazing amazing speaker and character. But one of the things he admitted in that talk was that when he grew up on a farm in the 1930s, he actually got a head injury and had a you know surgery on his head. Um, and when he was doing his admissions test at NASA to be an Apollo astronaut, he swapped his medical records with somebody else's and got to fly and pull up some amazing things, despite probably having a condition that would have disqualified him had they known about it at the time. I don't know when NASA finally caught on to that, but he talks about the story proudly now. Um, but yeah, so there was this, I just had a myth about this and it was quite interesting to see that that myth wasn't true so if you know you were considering even joining you know the traditional route going getting on the traditional route of being a nasa or european space agency astronaut or canadian space agency wherever whichever country you live in um the the door might be more open than you think um so that anyway, i just thought this research was really cool so anyway back to just this little chronology um that anna kindly talked about when so i you know having done various sort of space stuff when I was in uni, but not really kind of understanding how to get myself out of Australia. I happened on this con conference, which was the Space Generation Congress, as it was called at the time, um, which was um, in the in Houston in 2002. So I got a little scholarship to come to the US on my first trip to the US. And I went to this Space Generation event. And I had just gotten the first thing off my leg that I showed you in the photo about a week before this trip. In fact, I asked them to take it off slightly early so I could make it. And so I had not been walking on my own leg for about six months. And um, I get on a plane <laughs> and, and put on some jeans and try and hide it and uh, come to this thing with one, one very skinny little atrophied leg. Um, but at this conference, I met these 200 people in this photo who became my space family. I finally suddenly found my people because these were 200 other delegates from all around the world who were asking themselves the same question. How can we get to space? How can we put more stuff in space? And, um, you know, I think probably coming to that conference was the key turning point in my life in terms of being able to figure out how I was going to crack this nut and, and get myself to space. So at this conference, there were... Um, one day in the exhibit hall, exhibition hall, there was a local film crew, I think, from um, from either the university or a radio station in, uh, sorry, TV station in Houston. I'd forgotten which which group they were. But they were asking a bunch of students what their vision for space was. And they went down a line of about 15 of us who just happened to be nearby. I'm standing in this line and I don't know what to say. And they ask everybody down the line and they get to me and I just blurt out, I want to make space travel as easy as catching a bus. And that was the moment for me when space travel stopped being about my solo heroic journey of me going up to the space station or the you know, space shuttle as a pilot and the hero of the day, but actually realizing that if we don't go together, what's the point? And so suddenly, magically in that moment, my vision for the future enlarged and it suddenly became about all of these new friends. And I thought, wouldn't it be great to hold this conference in space? Um, so I'd love one day to have a space station where we can bring 200 people up and even have this I-Axis event in space. 
floating around. Wouldn't that be amazing? Um, so I suddenly, my vision changed and shifted in a, in a fairly profound way. And actually, when I got home, I put that on my website. And I think it's still actually up in the title of my website. Like, that's my goal in life, to make space travel as easy as catching a bus. And that means certain things, right? A bus is not a private jet. A bus is not a private yacht. A bus is not a limousine. A bus, you know, is even sometimes easier than a train, right? You just walk outside and you get on it. And the ticket is $1.50. And it takes you somewhere and the buses just come and go. So that little catchphrase to me had a lot of richness about what that vision meant. It's not just a single thing, but you can imagine what is a future in space where access is as easy as catching a bus. It means we can go up and down. We have frequent travel. Um, there are multiple destinations. There are many types and diverse types of people going. We can go often and frequently. And, you know, we can come back home and eat, uh, eat our food. So um, that really just kind of became my goal. And um, and together with many of these people, and there were many friends here in, in this photo included that ended up working at various companies like Virgin Galactic and, and Blue Origin and SpaceX um, that helped kind of like push, um, you know, things forward. Um, and just, by the way, just Anna, just on... on um, time i can't see the chats at the moment so if anyone wants to um either give me a time check or um uh just jump in with any questions just feel to interrupt feel free to interrupt me Absolutely. um so um yeah we you know this, suddenly i got this community of people that were all pulling in the same direction and some really magic stuff happened um one of them was i met this guy will marshall who became one of my lifelong friends and kind of like my um, kind of partnering crime on trying to cook up crazy ideas for space. And we ended up starting a company called Planet Labs that I that I call, I jokingly call a 10-year Socratic dialogue between Will and myself, where we just talked and talked and talked and talked and talked about how we were ever going to get ourselves to space or do something important in space. And so this is a photo um, from a, um, a conference called Bill, which was a fake conference that used to ride alongside Ted and be held in the same place, the joke being Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. So this is at the Bill Conference, uh, which was you know, this kind of un unofficial, sanction, unofficial yeah, um, Ted side, side event. Um, and we have here a little prototype of the satellite that we've been working on, um, which was trying to take off the shelf pieces of hardware and trying to build something fully functional in space to try and reduce the cost. And I remember um, getting laughed at by somebody that day saying that this wasn't credible and it was never going to work. Um, and we certainly couldn't have put that thing we were holding in space, holding there. We couldn't put that in space, but um, it would have, it, it certainly led to some interesting things. And also notable in this photo, it might look like I'm just kind of holding this thing, but I'm actually standing very strangely because um, I still had a broken, fully broken leg at that point. Um, and that was the one that I got surgery on later. So it was completely broken and I'm standing on it trying to pretend like it doesn't hurt. Um, but I always was embarrassed about this photo and actually many photos from that era because before I had the second leg fully healed, I kind of always felt like I was like walking, um, like kind of weird and every photo I hated, but now I look back on this and I, I kind of, at least have forgiven myself for feeling bad about that at the time. And this is actually the only, the first time I've ever mentioned that publicly, eh, by the way. Um, and so, yeah, hated every photo from myself in that era. Um, but, you know, I persevered. Um, so anyway, we I got a job um, through the space generation. Ultimately, um, after volunteering and running the conference for about six years, um, I got invited to work at NASA Ames, which is in Silicon Valley, which was amazing. I was finally at a NASA center um, right in the heart of innovation in Silicon Valley. So I couldn't have been more lucky, really. Um, and so we started working on some cool stuff. And one of my NASA bosses um, used to joke that his phone in his pocket was smarter than any satellite in space. And I think at the time he had a government issued Palm Pilot or Blackberry. And that was probably true. And it had more computer, more storage, maybe even a better camera than many satellites. It was smaller, cost three, four hundred dollars. Um and so after about two years of hearing him say this, we finally decided to pay attention and we started to try out this idea. So this is a a generation one Motorola Droid phone, an Android phone, 
in a vacuum chamber at NASA Ames in around 2009, I guess, according to the date, it was June 10. Um, <laughs> so um, this is, it, this photo is hard to, obviously on a, on a, just in a photo, it's hard to tell what's happening here, but this is inside a vacuum chamber pumped down to the vacuum of space and the phone is still operating. And I think today that's maybe not so surprising, but, you know, 15 years ago, that was a really unexpected result. We didn't know what would happen. We thought maybe some capacitors on the phone would blow up or um, the phone would overheat or the screen would expand and explode. Um, but no, it just worked just fine. We have a, that wire you see up the front is a thermocouple that we attach to it to measure the temperature. So this was kind of cool. And um, so then we had this idea, what if we could build really low cost satellites? And my idea was that if we could start launching really cheap five kilogram, five, 500 gram satellites and then launch five kilogram satellites and then 50 kilogram satellites, then 500 kilogram satellites, then five ton satellites, but always keep them cheap. Maybe I could back my way into a space station. Um, and so that's what we were sort of trying to work on was obviously if you're trying to build a large space station, as you know, the ISS costs billions and billions of dollars. This idea of having this bus in space is a little far out still because if every destination this bus goes to is 10 or $100 billion, then there's not going to be any buses, right? So this project was really important for us intellectually to try and start chipping away at that, that bus problem. So the next thing we did was like, okay, well, you know, phone works in a vacuum chamber. Does it like being on a rocket? And uh, so this uh, is a um, uh, video where of, we'll call our rocket cam where we took another Android phone, drilled a hole in the side of a sounding rocket, taped it on the inside with the camera pointing out of the hole, and wrote an app to be the flight control software of the phone and record some of the sensor data. Um, hang on, my light is flashing. Why is it doing that? One sec. There we go. Um, and record some sensor data from the phone as if this was a payload on a real rocket. And so just play this video. Hopefully the sound works. Uh, there is uh, captured in the ambient audio some mild swearing. Uh, if anyone uh, wants to mute their ears temporarily, um, but here it go. Here we go. Five, four, three, two, one. Come on. Chris, for the blind attendees in the room, can you describe a little bit about what's happening on the screen right now? Absolutely. Um, so there was a rocket out in the desert, in the Black Rock Desert, in the Mojave. And, so Black Rock Desert, sorry, in Nevada. And it's uh, about a 20-foot uh, tall sounding rocket. It's about eight inches across. And we've launched. And uh, after somebody pushed the button, it was about a, about a five second Christ, delay and then it went up yeah, it and then it descended very, very rapidly. Um, and almost immediately you could see from the camera, the earth receding away and, and the bright blue sky. Um, the rocket went up for about 40 seconds and then uh, reached its apogee. Um, and you can see from the ground, you could hear people yelling out as the rocket sort of rolled over from its height there. And then there was a parachute that came out automatically. And so the parachute popped out. And on the bottom of the video, I have a graph, which is the accelerometer from the phone. And so you can see when it's sitting on the ground, the accelerometer is reading um, nine meters per second squared, 9.8 meters per second squared, it's roughly 10 on that scale. So it's a little bit, a little bit off, but that's gravity. And then you see a huge peak just as it launches. Um, where the accelerator, in fact, it clips at 2G because that was the maximum dynamic range of the um, of the accelerometer on the phone. I mean, normally on the Earth, you don't expect your phone to be doing more than 2G of acceleration. So we get a we get a 2G clipped off signal, and then suddenly the rocket takes off, and then the phone for a brief period is in free fall, um, and so it's re me me measuring basically zero um, for a bit. And then as the parachute comes out, you get this turbulence as the line jiggles up and down on the graph, um, showing sort of the rough turbulent air. And so the graph is kind of cool because it captures all of the parts of the launch and shows that the phone can be a faithful um, observer and recorder of real events related to astronautics. Um, so we got the 
vacuum test results. And then we got this video of the um of the um of the flight. And if you put two and two together, you're like, okay, basically three things. It can launch on a rocket, um, it can do something useful, and it can survive in space. And so with that evidence, we convinced uh, NASA Ames to let us put one in space, which to my great surprise, they actually did. Hi. Oh, and so um, in, in this picture, we have um, a picture of what we call the phone sat, which was um, an Android phone, phone jump, jammed inside a 10 by 10 centimeter um, CubeSat with some extra batteries and an extra UHF radio plugged into the, um, into the USB port. Unfortunately, there's no cell signal in space, so um, you know, we had to add a, add a radio. Um, but this was, this is, and this is flying on a balloon. This, this photo is of a balloon test um, that we did just prior to launch. But this was a you know, roughly $5,000 satellite, all told. The batteries and the CubeSat shell were probably the most expensive thing with a $500 phone that we bought at Best Buy. Um, in fact, as a funny side note, we bought three phones for this project. And because they were considered spaceflight hardware, NASA put them in what they call bonded storage, which was a place for storing you know, extremely expensive spaceflight components. And we couldn't check them out to work on them because uh, there was spaceflight hardware. So we went back to Best Buy <laughs> and bought three more. And I believe that the three phones are still in bonded storage somewhere in NASA Ames waiting one day for something to happen. But at $500 a piece, you know, you can, why, you know, why treat them that way? So we were kind of trying to question a lot of the sort of um, assumptions about how one could build satellites. Um, so anyway, we launched this into space. Um, a couple of months later, we got this photo of the Earth, which is kind of blurry. It's um, This is from a cell phone camera. We wrote a pretty basic AI app for the time to pick the best photo. And clearly the app wasn't great because this photo is not super remarkable at all. Um, but you, know, you can see in the top right, the edge of the curvature of the Earth. And the blockiness is because we were sending down little packets over that UHF radio, which was actually a beacon radio. So we chopped the image up into little tiles and we didn't get all of the tiles back. Um, but this was a photo taken from space, from orbit, 400 kilometer orbit, from a satellite that we built for $5,000, um, which at the time certainly was the cheapest, highest capability satellite ever launched. Um, so got very excited by that. Um, and like, you know, everyone in Silicon Valley drinking our own Kool-Aid, we thought we should start a company. And so we left NASA to um, build this thing called Planet Labs, which was building larger, more sophisticated versions of this satellite. We got a, a really good high quality astronomical telescope and paired that with an industrial camera, replaced the phone with a slightly better computer. And you know, instead of costing $5,000, this was about the price of a Honda Civic, roughly the price of a car. Um, but this was an earth observing satellite that even at the price of a car was still a hundred or more times cheaper than any comparable satellite for the same camera in orbit. And so this was kind of cool. And as Anna mentioned, we got to launch several of them. I think now they've launched up to 600 of these. Um, not all of them are in orbit anymore, but this is a constellation of Earth observing satellites that map the whole world every day. And we could only get to that scale because we had chopped two zeros off the price. And which meant that we could launch a hundred times as many of them. Um, and we could also diversify risk and all of those things. So. Um, and here's a nice photo. This photo was actually taken through the window of, a, of the space station by an astronaut. I think it was Don Petty, but I'm not entirely sure if I'm remembering that correctly now. Um, but yeah, this was taken with an SLR camera out of the window. And this is two of our actual spacecraft um, above the limb of the Earth, um, you know, the horizon um, in space, just below the International Space Station. Um, and then we got this photo. So if you compare that to the grainy one I showed you a minute ago, this was the first photo from our Dove satellite from Planet. Um, and it is a, a, I think a radiator, radiata pine forest, like a, a managed forest plantation in Northwest Washington state. Um, and you can see trees, you can see roads, you can see power lines. Um, you can see the differences in fields that have been harvested and not ones that have been planted. Um, and I remember sending this to Will um, at about six, so actually at about three or four in the morning. And he woke up at about 6 a.m., saw my email, 
And he tells me that he laid in bed crying for an hour, so moved by this, because this image really spoke to a lot of the things we wanted to do in terms of stewarding the planet and and uh, almost everything, the entire mission of Planet Labs is represented in this photo. Um, one of my personal goals is to count every tree on the planet. Um, and this, you can see them, you can see each tree. Um, so Planet went off to become very successful. And this is a slightly um, out of date graph now, but um, a huge number of space companies emerged around that time um, over the next 10 years. And uh, due to work of many of the people in this room today in, on this conference and some of the people I mentioned at the conference I went to 15, 20 years ago. Um, so now I think there's probably, you know, almost like 5,000 space startups that have started in the last decade, which is really cool. And so I think we're getting closer to this sort of idea of there being stuff to do with our bus. Um, so then fast forward to um, 2021 and the era of COVID. Um, I was sitting on a beach in Hawaii, kind of not really knowing what to do. And I got a phone call from a friend who really doesn't call very often. Um, and I immediately knew what this person was calling me about. And her name was Ariane Cornell. And you might know her from the live stream broadcasts at Blue Origin. Um, so she, Ariane called me and said that uh, her founder, Jeff Bezos, the founder of Blue Origin, would be flying in... Um, in hopefully July uh, 2021, and would I like to go on that flight or the next flight? And I just said yes immediately. Um, and after a, a long, long process, eventually we agreed to put me on the second flight. And then I won the um, passenger jackpot because Jeff Bezos wanted to fly a guest on the second flight, and he picked William Shatner. And so I got to fly um, alongside William um, and uh, the wonderful Audrey Powers from Blue Origin. And then to our right is Glenda Rees, who sadly passed away in an airplane crash in uh, late 2021. Um, so he's no longer with us, but he was an amazing uh, daredevil and adventurer. And uh, you can tell from his giant smile, he lived every day to his fullest. Um, so he's, he's dearly missed, but it was a real privilege to to go to space with, with these three people. Um, and so just briefly, um, this is the this is a view. I'll give you a little overview of of the um the flight, and then I have a little video I can show to wrap up here. Um, so this is uh the launch site one out in um, Van Horn, Texas, the Blue Origins property there, and in the center is the New Shepard launch vehicle, all loaded and ready to go with the capsule on, and sitting just at sunrise, just before our flight. Um, and then here's a photo from from the time of liftoff. Um, it's pretty cool. And just like our little uh, phone sat video, you know, you've got a nice little plume of dust and great fire from the engine. And you know, these photos obviously taken from a, a good number of miles away. Um, so it's very small, but I think it's very cool. And just how the suborbital flights work for Blue Origin, for those of you who are not familiar, the New Shepard is a reusable launch vehicle. It has a um, booster and a capsule. Um, and so the rocket takes off um and the main after main engine shut off the um, capsule separates and then we float around and then on the right hand side of this picture you can see our trajectory we cross the common line in our case i think we went to 107 kilometers um and had about four minutes of weightlessness and then we float back down to the ground and then the booster in the meantime um does its own thing turns around comes back and lands on a, on a landing pad and in fact on the way down um, because our capsule is rotating, Glenn got to see the capsule landing through the window and was like, there's the capsule. Um, and then I had to wait about two minutes for it to turn around for me to get a little view of it just as we were about to touch down. But that's pretty cool seeing one of those things land. Um, so I, I originally had a whole bunch of slides and, and little pieces of video that I thought I could show you. But I just, I don't know if you can tell by the row of guitars on behind me, I also... Um, have a sort of over, overgrown hobby as a musician, trying to make music to inspire people to to do some of the work we're talking about here today, to take up STEM careers, to do science, to go to space, to look at the universe, um, you know, fight climate change, fight injustice around the world, to try and write inspiring music. And I just have been, as part of my processing of this space flight, I've been trying to write some songs about my experience. And so I'm going to play you one of them with a music video that'll actually show you a montage of some of the events of the day. Um, 
And, you know, going to space was certainly challenging. And, you know, I mentioned back in the beginning, my childhood view of this sort of solo heroic journey of going to space. And now I've realized, of course, the story is bigger than all of us, right? And, um, you know, in particular, um, when you fly into space, you've got loved ones you leave behind on the ground. And so this song in particular is that story of how, you know, I did go up, but, you know, every, everything that we love and treasure at the end and tre tre cherish is still here on earth, which to me makes that bus thing even more important. You know, when I don't necessarily want to go to Mars on a one-way trip and die there. I love everyone on this planet and this planet, and I want to come back to it. And um, I really felt that myself when I was up um, looking down on Earth, realizing that all 7 billion people were there. Um, just before we get to the song, one of the, I should acknowledge that my two co-writers of this song. So just after my flight, I had previously booked a songwriting retreat in Ojai, California, up in the wine country there. And um, I decided I'd still go to it. So I just spent more, about 10 days or so in science and engineering land, you know, doing astronaut training and hanging out with engineers and um, really hard science stuff. And I suddenly show up at this music event where just as I arrive, everyone is in a listening circle on the grass holding hands. And it was this huge shift of energy and in a way quite jarring. But, um, you know, I, I think I wrote, we wrote a bunch of songs with some of the people there. Um, and, you know, obviously was telling them about my trip to space. So about a month later, Two of the people I met, Adrian S, uh, Adrian Comnus and and so Adrian uh, Essiet and Lucia Comnus, they um, reached out to me and said that they'd written a song or started writing a song about my story, and the song was called Zero Gravity, and they had somehow channeled that m emotion that I talked about about realizing that everybody was down here on Earth still. And so they'd, they'd written like a half the first verse and part of the chorus and, and some of the music. And so we, together with the two of them, we co-wrote this song together. We finished it off, wrote the second verse, um, polished some of the bits, um, wrote a bridge and sort of put in some more personal stuff about my experience. And then uh, two months ago, I recorded all of the music for my version and had a friend of mine sing it. And I put edited together a whole bunch of footage from Blue Origin of the flight along with some new stuff. So that's a lot of a lot of uh, <laughs> introduction, but um, you yeah, really just wanted to acknowledge the origin of this song, which was which was in a way one of the greatest gifts somebody had ever given me to like write a song about my experience that actually spoke authentically to exactly how I felt. So here we are. Let's have a listen. And Chris, please feel free to describe things happening in the video if you'd like to share that context as well. Um. Well, it's going to be hard to talk over the singing. Sure. Um, perhaps, can I perhaps maybe do that at the end? Yeah, that sounds great. Thank you. Yeah, I'll re maybe revisit it at the end. Um, or I can run through it twice, maybe, if we have time. But right. Anyway, this I'll start. This is a rocket about the takeoff sequence of the rocket. Looking out the window. Through the window at the shades of blue Heard I link so fast through the unknown Honey, there's a light I left behind for you To shine up here and guide this spaceship home Oh, oh high or terrified Ultraviolet memory has eclipsed my life Far away from home In zero gravity Weightless in a bottle
changed that would have seen far away from home. talk about this last bit here um in the spirit of marvel movies there's a little post credit sequence um so we have a view of the space capsule again and i look around on the inside and it's empty which is a bit of a mystery why is it empty um and then i open the door <laughs> um so i'm going to come back to that in a minute but um for those of you who didn't see the video um I'll just sort of run through the summary quickly. So there's there's the launch of the rocket taking off, and I get very excited, and I'm looking out of the window, and then we cut to many of the people on the ground, and um, you know I'm saying you know, and we cut back to me saying goodbye to my vet girlfriend Vanessa and her looking pretty upset, um, and then shots of her and and uh, some of the other you know family members watching the launch taking off, and you can see they've got their like they're biting their hands, they've got their hands over their mouth and they've got that classic shocked looking face and chewing their fingernails. Um, and uh, when we had dinner with Jeff Bezos, I wanted to include Jeff, there's a picture of Jeff and his partner Lauren in there as well. I wanted to include that because Jeff said on his flight, um, when he came back, he had the same experience that his um, his entire family, he'd had a huge amount of fun with his brother up in space. He came back and his whole family had been crying and his nephew had passed out from shock. Um, and so I wanted to include that moment of them living that again and Jeff living that from the ground himself, seeing us go up. Um, and so then um, we cut in the second verse um, is the, this line about me realizing that every human being that I've ever loved is down here on earth. And the video goes into an imaginary scene that we shot here in, in Oakland, in California, of me inside my head um, trying to reconnect back with earth, even though I'm in space, it's me imagining everyone down on earth um and then we go back up space for the chorus and then the capsule lands and we reconnect with our loved ones and everyone's hugging and crying and kissing and you know welcoming everyone back and there's a really nice scene in there of the four of us in the capsule just as we landed we actually they opened the door and we decided we didn't want to go out yet and we wanted just another it felt like felt like minutes but it was probably seconds of us just being ourselves and we all had tears streaming down our face. And um, it was just really nice to just hug all four astronauts before we walked out and got bombarded by by press and excitement. Um, yeah, and then, uh, you know, then Audrey's there with her dog. She had brought a dog to the flight. So her dog was very excited to see her. And um, we we're all safely back and um, back in the arms of our loved ones. And so then on this post credit scene, why I wanted to include that was just to talk about this really sort of powerful experience I had up there. Um, I remember looking out into the blackness of space. And if anyone's seen that movie, Donnie Darko, there's this thing where they have like these kind of like time traveling worms that come out of their chest as they get, there's the kid, um, Jay Gyllenhaal gets dragged around his house by this stuff. I kind of felt that it was like a, almost like a tractor beam almost through the window, pulling on my chest, pulling me out. And if the window or the door had been open, I literally would have stepped outside. And it was not like in a horror movie kind of way, but in a way almost like a, a sort of fundamental force of the universe acting on me um, and encouraging me and seducing me to keep going further into space. And I've sort of described it lately as like a genetic switch that turned on, like an explorer's gene that triggered in me and said, you've got to keep going out further into space. And so that post-credit scene 
um, I imagine what that future might look like if I had opened the door. And so I'm working on another video, um, which is animated, um, where I open the door and I step out into space and uh, we'll see what happens. But with that, um, I just want to thank everyone for being here. And I want to thank um, um, the, the the ASL interpreters. Um, I did say Rhonda, but now it says Elise. But um, you, are you both there? But I just want to thank you for, for being here today and, and doing a, a great job, uh, particularly on the video. So, um, And uh, with that, I'll hand it back to Anna. Thank you so much, Chris. That was fantastic. We do have about 10 minutes left here, so we'll go ahead and open it up to questions. So if anyone has questions, please go ahead and submit them through the Q&A feature, and we'll try to get through as, as many as we can. Um, I think, Chris, one of the things on my mind, you know, so it sounds like hearing your journey and experience, when you look at the traditional NASA astronaut requirements, it seems like you would have been disqualified perhaps doubly, you know, maybe on the colorblindness side and due to the different surgeries is that accurate is that your understanding as well and and if well, so I mean how does that speak to you know the need for for change in some of these regulations for who is allowed to go to space and you know what's acceptable and what isn't well I, I think maybe it was more just a misunderstanding that I had and I think my point there was that it was a misconception and it limited me um and it was my own belief system not really the reality and I think perhaps you know obviously there are you know, at, when you have a new pool of astronauts, they want to pick the best, right? So they probably do stack rank them, but there are trade-offs to be made. And there's certainly that research showed to me that there were things that either could happen to you while being an astronaut in training, or perhaps you already had that were acceptable. And I just didn't know that. Um, right. So I just, you know, I just felt like, you know, sometimes we make assumptions that we can't. And um, I think maybe that even that wasn't even true. So. Right. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, yeah. That, that's very powerful. Um, one question I, I have here comes uh, to the music connection. Um, it's exciting to see the music connection threaded throughout this year's conference. Um, Lachi is our keynote speaker tomorrow, who is also a singer songwriter. Uh, and um, this question asks, in what ways has your musical background influenced the way you approach more classically STEM based challenges in your work? Oh, wow. I've never thought of that question. I usually think of the opposite direction, mm. which is um, I'm probably like a better engineer than I am um, a, a, a creator. Mm -hmm. um, so I really like, you know, if someone brings me a song, I know how to finish it. Like I can, I can engineer it, I can record it, I can mix it, I can do all of the technical aspects. But the creative part, um, and like coming up with a really good melody that's harder for me. Um, and so I find if I'm certainly if I'm collaborating with someone, um, I'm happy to take a back seat on the creative side, but to be, a, you know, play the role of a good editor. And, um, you know, so I think definitely my science background has, and my engineering background has given me some really great strengths on a team musically. Um, the other way around, I mean, I think maybe I've just always been creative. I think it's just this the yeah, aspect of creativity wherever you apply it um i've always liked you know breaking things I'm, i think i be became a good engineer because i used to break things at home and then my mom would force me to fix them um so i learned to fix which is how i learned to build things but it's also in music i would um you know i try and when i was in high school i'd try and recreate songs and re-record them again attracted slightly to the engineering side but I was always curious how music was made and I would pull songs apart and try and re-record my own. I'd spend my entire summer holidays indoors recording music. Um, so um, yeah, always just was curious how things work, I think. And um, and yeah, so, so just exploring how, how was it made? And I think the act of creation is magical, right? You take nothing and you make a melody, suddenly you've created something in the world is enriched by it even. So I just like, you know, how is it made? How do you make stuff? always been my question. Amazing, thank you. Uh, we have a few classrooms tuning in uh, with their, their classes watching all together. And so one of the students asks, how long did it take you to put on an ast the astronaut suit? That's a great question. So this astronaut suit um, is kind of like a car racing suit. It's a um, Nomex fireproof racing suit. 
and it's been just modified for the the um the branding of Blue Origin, but it really is mostly a, a fire a fire a racing car fire suit. Um, so it's pretty quick to put on. Um, you know, you just step inside it and zip it up, and um, they have some really cool car racing shoes that are also fireproof. And then we have these fitted um gear plugs that were custom molded for us because the rocket is really really loud, so that's like the most essential thing. Um, to put that on and then probably the hardest part is we had a lot of microphones so they like have like a microphone pack that they put in and they wire it up for our suit and stuff and that took about half an hour but yeah putting on the suit is, is pretty quick thank you uh, adrian asks have you ever considered joining one of the axiom missions to the international space station oh that's a great question um i'd love to actually um they're just a little bit expensive that's probably the the biggest issue um and i think for me I want to, at least my next thing in space, I want to build something. So I'm really curious, um, like what, what I can contribute and flying up to space would be cool. Um, again, I'd love to do it. I, you know, because of that feeling I had of this exploration feeling, I would love to do it again, but I want to make sure the next thing I do is also contributing something. And I want to, haven't found a way yet to really have impact on that. So I'm still sort of wait, waiting to find what that might be. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the next question I have is, how did it, you navigate it when you were feeling that you could not have a chance to go to space? And what advice would you have for others who may be encountering that same feeling? Yeah, I mean, there were definitely some bad times and good times. Um, I remember in 2003 when the Columbia Space Shuttle um, uh, disintegrated on reentry. I kind of felt like my career was over. I'm like, this is never going to work. What am, why am I doing any of these things? Like, this is, you know, a huge step back for humanity and, and you know, obviously a horrible tragedy. And I remember really, it really hit me hard, that event. And I remember being really depressed for many months, thinking I just need to do something else with my life, right? Um, and then in 2004, there was the Ansari X Prize. So it's a year, only a year later. But um, in 2004, somebody won the X Prize and um, sent, a, you know, a crewed, non-governmental spaceship into space. And I went out to the Mojave Desert to see that launch, and um, you know, that was the moment I got belief in citizen space. Um, so there's been events that have, you know, made it harder, some that have made it easier, but. I think I also just never gave up. And it took, like I said at the beginning, it took me 27 years to get to space. And humans like round numbers, right? Like what if I'd gotten to 10 and said, I quit, right? It's like 25. I spent 25 years of my life on this. I'm going to give up. I think I was just too stupid to do that. So <laughs> I didn't. And it took 27. And I didn't know that. I didn't know when I was sitting on this beach in Hawaii, hiding out from COVID that I was going to get a call. It just happened. And you know, they say um, good luck is when preparedness meets opportunity. And so I just stayed on mission and didn't really ever want to do anything else. So I think just having that, being comfortable with my choice and just not giving up, you just never know. I mean, some I don't know how many other things we would wait 27 years for, but it was worth waiting. Amazing. Thank you. Uh, Zach asks, what is one of the best skills to master in order to be prepared to go to space? Hmm. Great question. Um, I think one thing I wish I was better at was being a good observer. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, whether it's something like going on hikes or um, being in nature, you know, being a bird watcher or something, but I kind of wish I had remembered more of the little details from the flight. And they don't really cover that in the training. Um, and, you know, if it hadn't, you know, one of the things that I saw was that on the first flight, Jeff Bezos's flight with his brother and, and Wally Funk and Oliver Damon, you know, they were having a lot of fun, but I think they, they wasted a lot of time in the capsule doing acrobatics instead of looking out of the window. Um, so I kind of decided I was going to mostly look out of the window, but I still wasn't very good at it. And I think with these new sort of democratized access space flight, they haven't really figured out the training yet of how to maximize your value up there, your value you get you know your time how to get the most out of your time there so yeah i just wish i i was a more trained and disciplined observer with a system for remembering things that would have been really nice thank you 
I'm going to end here with a really fantastic question from Sheila, who says, from your perspective, what is the biggest challenge in making human spaceflight more accessible and inclusive to people with disabilities? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I think it's cost, really. Um, it's really just a, a waiting game to get costs down, I think. And the biggest work that we can all do is to make spaceflight reliable and frequent. Um, and it's the frequency where the cost will come down. And I think, you know, you know, as you know, I remember um Anna, we first connected when you were, you know, flying the zero G plane and taking people up on zero G. Weightlessness is wonderful. Um and many of our limitations are actually alleviated when we're in space. It's just the hard part is getting there. And so I think we just need to work really hard to build that bus, get the cost down to bus pricing, and then we can all go. And I think that's, I'd love that. I'd love for you all to join us up there. Amazing. And on that note, Sciaxis in space. Let's, let's, uh, let's, uh, I love, I love that concept of let's set that goal. future, future conference location. Here we come. <laughs> Sci <laughs> Access. Learn more at www.sciaccess.org.